Welcome to our 12th Cornerstone Connection lesson. Today on the set, we have Chia Bridget, Misati, Silas, and Deborah. On orchestra, we have Elsie and Ashleen, and Joyce will be doing sign language for us today. Before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. Father Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for waking up us today. Thank you for life. Thank you for good health. Thank you for strength. As we're about to start, may your spirit be with us. Teach us. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. So the title of today's mission is Keeping Sabbath Holy. Achia loved mother very much, but mother did something that made Achia feel very sad. Mother worked on Sabbath. Mother owned a store in her house in the African country of Ghana. People came to the store every day to buy milk, bread, eggs, and cookies. But Sabbath was the most popular shopping day. More people bought food on Sabbath than any other day of the week. Mother made a lot of money on Sabbath, even though she didn't work a full day. She only worked until 9 o'clock. Then she closed the store and went to church. Mother, as she said, you told me that it's wrong to sell on Sabbath. It was true. Mother had taught Achia and her younger brother, Akwasi, that God forbid people from working on Sabbath. In the fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath holy to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Exodus 20, 8 to 10. But mother kept on working on Sabbath. Mother said her brother, Ms. mother said her brother, Akwasi, it's wrong to sell on Sabbath. But mother kept on working on Sabbath. Achia and Akwasi prayed for people to stop coming to the house to shop on Sabbath, but people kept coming. Mother got quite annoyed when neither Achia asked her to stop selling. Then Achia went away to a special camp meeting for children. For 10 days, she woke up at 4.30 a.m. when a bell rang to call all children to pray. With a heavy heart, Achia thought about mother back home. God, the first thing that I want to hear when I return home is that mother has stopped working on Sabbath, she prayed. She prayed the same prayer every morning. On the last day of camp meeting, Achia prayed, this is our last day. If you have not done anything in answer to my prayers for the past nine days, I'm begging you to do something on this last day. The first thing that I want to hear when I return home is that mother has stopped working on Sabbath. Arriving home later that day, Achia was greeted by her brother. He ran out of the house. He didn't even say hello. Just blurted out, mother has stopped selling on Sabbath. Achia couldn't believe her ears. She ran into the house to ask mother for herself. Mother, have you stopped selling on Sabbath? She said. It was true. Mother explained that she had been working on Sabbath to save money for a new house. She had been hiding the money in a secret place. But while Achia was at her meeting, she had lost the money. She couldn't remember spending it. She couldn't remember moving in t into a new hiding place. She was certain that no burglar had stolen it. It was gone. She wondered if God had taken back the money that she had worked to earn on his Sabbath. So, mother told Achia, I have stopped working on Sabbath. Achia was so happy. It had taken her a long time, but God had heard Achia's prayers. Mother has never worked again on Sabbath. Although mother has never found the missing money, she doesn't mind. She told Achia, God gave me the money, so it's fine if you took it back again. Today, Achia is starting to become a nurse at a college that will receive part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering. Thank you for planning a generous offering next Sabbath to help more students study at the Seventh-day Adventist Nursing and Midwifery Training College.
Amen. Thank you so much, our orchestra, for such a timely song. So we are studying the topic, The Fall and Rise of David, which is very much in line with the song that has just been played, Jesus, I Come. Now, before we begin, I'd like to introduce my panelists. So as I introduce you, maybe you can just wave. So starting from my far left, I have Misati. Then we have Silas on my immediate left and we have Deborah on my right. So before we begin, let me invite Silas to pray for us. Let's pray. Our Father, there is love in heaven. Thank you for this day. As we read your word, we pray that you may guide us and help us to understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My name is Bridget. I'll be your moderator for today. So as I mentioned, we are going through lesson 12. Kindly um, go to the Cornerstone Connections and turn to lesson 12 with us. The title is The Fall and Rise of David. And um, we know one of the most common stories we know about David is his story with Goliath. So the David and Goliath story. But similarly, there is also a very other interesting story that we know about David of one of the most grave sins that he committed during his rulership. And so today that is what we are going to study and see what are some of the lessons that we can learn from it as teens. Now, before we begin, I'd like us to explore our fundamental belief for this lesson, which is fundamental belief number 23, that is marriage and the family. Now, remember, during creation, God instituted two, um, in two institutions. Let me use that word. So marriage was one of them, and the Sabbath was the other. And truly, even when you look at this day and age, those are two of the institutions that the devil is seeking to actually destroy before the Lord comes. So um, in terms of marriage, marriage was divinely established by God in Eden, and it was affirmed by Jesus to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman in loving companionship. Please take note of those words, between a man and a woman in loving companionship. For the Christian, a marriage commitment is to God, as well as to the spouse. And it should only be entered into between a man and a woman who share a common faith. So we're going to see how was um, the marriage um, institution broken or was there any interference that happened in our story for today? So as we proceed, I'm going to invite um, Deborah to help us see what do we think about this lesson today. Uh, so in the what do you think section, mm -hmm. it's a well-known truth that Dishonesty has a way of compounding and building itself when one tries to maintain the lie more. When one tries to maintain the lie more and more. So, at what point on the continuum do you think it's most difficult for someone to confess and repent of a lie? First, when you when you first realize that lying is an option, after you have made the first step into dishonesty, after you have had to cover the first lie with an with another when all the evidence is making it clear that you have been dishonest, but it is too big to own. So, um, repenting of a lie becomes increasingly difficult at each step along the continuum. Mm -hmm. However, many find it difficult to, d difficult, especially at the, at the third point, after you have had to cover the first lie with another. Mm -hmm. This is because the web of deception grows, making, making it harder to unravel without facing consequences, and the fear of exposure intensifies for the individual. Mm. Just like in the situation of the story of David and his story with the wife of Uriah. Amen. Thank you for that. I totally agree with you. Usually making the first step is the hardest. Like making that decision of, I actually want to lie, that's the hardest. But after you've made it, then the subsequent steps become easier and easier. And as she said, it becomes even more difficult to repent the deeper you go in. So I'd like to invite um, Silas, maybe you can read for us the did you know and then take us right into the story. Okay, the did you know section is in Samuel, Second Samuel 20, 12 verse 25. 12 verse 5? So the twelve verse five. Mm -hmm. The Bible says David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord li lives, the man who do this must die. When David heard Nathan tell the story of how the rich man 
was unwilling to take a sheep from the many he had, took the one precious lamp from a poor man. He was incensed. As a matter of fact, the phrase David burned with anger refers to breathing rapidly in passion, especially through the nose. <laughs> Perhaps you have noticed that when some people get really angry, their nostrils flare out. Mm. Perhaps David's nostrils are <laughs> flaring with a demand of justice. Okay. You can take us right into the story for today. So the story today is about David being told about his sin by Nathan. Mm -hmm. And Nathan used a parable to tell him his sin. And for some time, David didn't really understand that the parable was directly linked to him. And he, when he was angry and he, want, he was demanding for justice, he didn't recognize that that was his sin. Mm. And he... He acknowledged that the person had done something wrong, mm. not knowing that he was the person being referred to. Mm -hmm. And in this story found in Second Samuel 12, verse 1 to 13. Thank you so much for that, Silas. So I just want to, to, for us to reflect on the story. And let's just go back. So um, our story actually is from Second Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. So let's just step back and go to chapter 11. Where did this story begin? Yeah, so if you read chapter 11, verse 1, David had done something. Remember, this was a time when the kings were supposed to have gone for battle, but he decided that he's going to do it. He's going to tarry a little longer. And this reminds me also of the story of Dina. You remember the only sister of um, the 12 brothers, so Jacob's daughter, Remember, there was a time when she was free and she just decided that she wanted to go out and see what the world had to offer. And you remember what came as a result of that. So David, here we can see the scene started with him just deciding, I'm not going to battle, I'm going to tarry in Jerusalem. And then now it goes, what happened when he tarried in Jerusalem? Maybe someone can just take us through um, that story as we go on. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the thing is, one thing I find fascinating with the Bible mm -hmm. is it tries to condense everything that happened in, like, phrases. Yes. Because, I mean, okay, I'm, I'm reading the story now, and I'm, like, applying, like, good sense, and I'm, like, something, the math isn't math. <laughs> like, a, a lot has just been compressed. But generally, this is how I, I see how the story plays out. So the story starts out with David's on his bed. So mm -hmm. he leaves his bed, goes to his rooftop, palazzo, his penthouse, somewhere, he's chilling up there. <laughs> then where he is, I think it's a way that the palace and then Uriah must have been a high-ranking official. That's right. So, so this is Uriah's wife, but Sheba, she's bathing outside because she's like, no one's around. <laughs> like, of course, no one's around. They've and gone to battle. They've all gone, so I'm like, I'm not guilty. Mm. Yeah, so she just bathes because she's like, it's my peace, we are women around here, it's I. Others are also purifying themselves, you know? Because mm. I think when, when he mentions her impurity, I think that's like her menstruation cycle. Yes, yes. That would make sense on how she would actually conceive a child. Like, we're using logic here. So the thing is, so she had been cleansed of her impurity. Then David sees her and is like, bring her to me. But then someone around David says, uh, hold up, big guy. This is the wife of Uriah. Mm. I mean, and I think David was like, mm, mm, mm. okay, bring her. I mean, then after, after that, so she's told, yo, David wants you. Mm. I think maybe she, for herself, she's like, uh, okay, fine. Like, why does he want me? Maybe she's like, ah, let me just go. Then I think, so the Bible is interesting. It just says, she was called, she came, she had sex. I, I'm sure it's uh, like, that's it's like vague, like vagueness. Mm. But anyway, that's actually what happened. Then she goes... She conceives, then she sends her. Yeah, that must have been quite a good amount of time. time yeah. Like it's like give it a month, a month or two later. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, by the way, David, you know, you remember two months ago, <laughs> I'm now pregnant. And then David's like, you know what? I, 
okay, let's see how we can, we can baptize my, yeah. my scene and pray people will not notice mm. that she gave birth in seven months. Yeah. Let's, not, let's, <laughs> us, let's just, people won't notice, okay? So he says, call you Raya. Raya is called. Then David says, you know, my guy, you've done so good. You're great. You're everything. Do this. Just live here. Go and wash your feet. That is. I mean, so of course, that's it's a euphemistic because it's like, yeah, go. Now go and baptize my sin. It's like, mm. please, please go baptize my sin. But Uriah, what he does is that he goes to the gate and he sleeps there that night. Yeah. Then the following day, David's like, hold up, my guy. Like, why haven't you gone to your house? Then Uriah is like very funny. He's like, as, as long as you live and your soul lives, I cannot do this thing. Yes. While the ark of God, when people are fighting, I can't do this thing, man. As in, there's a time for everything. So he's not clear. Then David's like, what? This man's planning to foil me. So he's like, let me get him drunk tonight. So he gets him drunk. But even in his drunkenness, he's like, I'm still chilling at the gate, man. So I'm, I'm still there. <laughs> still there at the gate. Okay, and the saddest part of it all is that Bathsheba never said like goodbye to her husband. Yes. Because, I mean, I mean, there's no space indicated. So David's like, what? This guy. So let's do this. He sends Uriah back to battle. Sends Job, tells him that. Put him at the heat of the battle. Then, when the people come out to him, mm. vanish. So, as in, that's exactly what happens. What happened? Mm. And when the message is sent back, David's like, ah, Nisawa too, see, these things happen. These things happen. Yeah. Why, why are you fretting? People die. Anyone can be killed yeah. in battle. Anyone can be killed. Mm. And because of that, then, then Bathsheba, I think she's most sad. But, I mean, at, at points, I, I just ask myself, is it tactfulness or tactlessness? Because it's like, <laughs> She's crying for her husband. It's like, David's like, oh, by the way, Mimi ni option Pia. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, is, it, is that, I think that, that looks very tactless. It's like, yes. by the way, you know, I'm an option. So mm. stop crying. I'm here. <laughs> so that's how, like, he takes her and then she becomes the wife. And mm. I think the way it relates with, like, the story of that, that parable mm. is like, you know, I think, like, David had women in his humongous palace and then he had to go sit standing on the roof and look he's like i mean you'd have been like okay sour call someone mm. i mean because of course it's not like they i mean with all that probability it's not like all of them were busy all of them on their periods yes. like <laughs> let the math math you know so that's, that's exactly the thing mm. so in this case i think then you know where it gets hilarious is like David is breathing fire. He's like, how can this man do this? Mm. He's like, oh, by the way, my guy, anyway. It's He's you. like, what? Oh, Kumbi. Mm. Like, by the way, mm. it's me. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, Thank you so much for that um, summary. That's a very clear summary. And maybe let me ask maybe two questions. So my first question is, we see that Bathsheba was called and she agreed to actually come and she did lay with David. Don't you think she had the powers to actually reject and say, you know, no, please, I cannot do such a sin. I love my husband. Why do you think she just accepted? Maybe just your thoughts. Anyone? Debbie, what do you think? Um, I think she was just, she just went to the flow. I mean, mm. it's the king who called her. Who yes. Didn't, who didn't agree to that. Yes. Yeah, she just went to the <laughs> yes. I think uh, when we uh, started learning about David, remember we were told that, one, he was a handsome man. That's the first thing. Two, here he is. He's a king. And of course, there was some respect that was always due to the king. So I think she felt obligated to actually just, you know, agree to what his demands were. Those are my thoughts, but I think that's food for thought. But at the end of the day, remember that both of them had sinned. Because she refused to um, reject and say, I cannot do such a grave sin, she also had sinned. Because if you read Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10, it says that if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. So in this case, it means that both of them were actually guilty. It wasn't only David alone. So my question is, did Bathsheba also repent? That's, that's food for thought. Anyway, so um, my second question would be, why do you think Prophet Nathan decided to use a parable? Why do you think he said, I just won't go and condemn this sin as it is. Let me come through using a parable. Anyone? Okay, I think when someone gives you your sin the way it is, mm. 
for you to accept it. And for David as a man with all the power, he, was, he ruled over the whole world. Mm -hmm. So as a man with that kind of power, admitting his sin would be very difficult. Mm. Or he would have used unjust measures to cover up his sin because he was he had already started mm -hmm. covering up. Mm -hmm. So what Nathan did was bring out the sin, not necessarily it being his. Mm -hmm. And for him to acknowledge that it's a mistake, and once he acknowledges it, he he sees the fault in him. Mm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think typically as, as human beings, we have a habit of being defensive and gaslighting people. Yes. I think, you know, the thing is, if Nathan showed up and was like, you guy, my guy, I know what you did. You slept with Bathsheba. Mm. You killed Uriah. I mean, the thing is, it's like, hey, this guy will be like, what? Ah, uh -uh, no, please, please, mm. please, so Uriah died deaths. a natural death. This guy, he just, just Joab was a bit foolish. <laughs> A new story with Bathsheba, but you know, it's not that serious. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not that serious. Mm. I'll just marry her and we are done. She will share. No, she won't share. He's <laughs> dead. It's okay. I can marry her. You know? Mm, yeah. It, it just light. It just light. Yeah, it's true. Human beings, as you've said, are very defensive. And oftentimes, if you are told your sin, um, if it's directed to you as it is, you feel like, honestly, I don't even understand why you would do that. Please keep it off. So truly human beings are defensive. Now the last question I want us to answer from, it's just right there out of the story, is how would you describe David's repentance? Do you think David sincerely repented because he was convicted of his sin or because he was caught? And how can you tell the difference? So maybe we can just read the part that... Um, he actually realized that he had done a sin, which is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. That's in verse 13. Actually, let me start with verse 11, where he, he, some judgment was proclaimed on him. So this is what the Lord said after he, um, David had sinned. He said, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. So it's like some, something that he had done was now being done for him. Then verse 12 say, says, For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And verse 13, where I want us to focus on, it says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. So you can see David is already saying here, oh my goodness, I have really done such a terrible thing. So do you think from this, at least from this phrase, do you think that his repentance was genuine? Okay, I think David being a man who understood right and wrong, mm. saw the fault in what he had done, mm -hmm. and he sincerely wanted to repent. Mm. Not because he was caught on the spot, but because he had done wrong mm. and he had seen his mistake. Amen. Amen. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and also just to add on to that, if you read the further insight, it says, The prayer of David after his fall illustrates the nature of true sorrow for sin. In fact, that prayer is the one that is in Psalms 51, create in me a clean heart. I think that's the phrase that we all know, 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a righteous spirit within me. So that was his prayer. So that prayer of David after his fall illustrates the nature of true sorrow for sin. His repentance was sincere and deep. David saw the enormity of his transgression. It was not for pardon only that he prayed, but he prayed for a purity of heart. And may that be our prayer, dear viewers, even whenever we have sinned or committed sins, um, whether public or private, may we come back to God and say that indeed, Lord, please create within me a clean heart. Okay, so I think we'll move on to our key text, um, which is the money part. So Debbie, you can take us through it. Um, the key text, which is found in Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, 
Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. So this was basic, this part was basically basically conveys the full and complete repentance of David to God. Mm-hmm. And I think it, this, this verse, it reminds me of another verse in the Bible that says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Amen. So I think this is a part that hit David when he realized how bad his sin was. Mm-hmm. And I think it was during his time that when such a sin was committed, you had to be stoned to death. Yes. And for him to be pand- pardoned from that, it was it was a relief to him. Mm. And he had to thank God for that. Amen. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think it's important for us to realize, even from our key texts, that whenever we commit sin, it's not only against the human being. You know, sometimes there are sins that we commit and then you feel like, wow, I've really hurt. Now, in this case, it would have been he would have felt guilty and sorry for committing that sin against Uriah. Now, assuming that Uriah didn't die in battle, yeah? But now it's important for us to remember that God is also very much hurt whenever we sin. So never take God out of the picture whenever you've done anything wrong to someone. He's the one who is hurt first, and then that individual next. So how about we go right into um, our flashlight section? So, Misati, you can take us through that. So, whoever under the reproof of God will humble their soul with confession and repentance, as did David, may be sure that there is hope for him. Whoever will in faith accept God's promises will find pardon. The Lord will never cast away Mm. one truly repentant soul. Mm. Amen. So, um, in line with that, um, the Tuesday part was just encouraging us to write a prayer to God embracing the promise that he has given to us. And maybe you can think about someone you know who responds to God's voice promptly when they sense that they have done something wrong. Um, These people who often say things like, you know, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I was being selfish. And, you know, um, think about how such people can shape your life. So that is just our challenge for the Tuesday part. So let's move on to our punchlines for this week. So Silas, you can guide us through that. The punchlines for our lesson today. Okay, so our first punchline comes from the book of Psalms chapter 51, verse 10 to 12. It mm-hmm. says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take the Holy Spirit from me. Restore me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So in this flashlight, we see David thanking God and asking him to renew him. Mm. And he was thanking God because God had taken away his sin Mm. and forgiven him. And the consequences weren't as bad as what he deserved. That's true. Yeah. Amen. Maybe, Miss Hattie, you can also pick a punchline. Uh, so my punchline is mm-hmm. Psalm 32, 5, the message translation specifically. Mm. Then I let it all out. I said, I'll come clean about my failures to God. Suddenly the pressure was gone. My guilt dissolved. My sin appeared. Amen. What about you, Debbie? Any punchline that you feel speaks to you? Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7, Mm -hmm. let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought and let him return unto the Lord Mm. and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Amen. We are just seeing the nature of our God. He is a merciful and a loving father and though we deserve death time and time again, you know in this day and age, it's just that our, the results of our sin are not immediate. So we cannot be stoned if we do something. And oftentimes our sins are private. But if God were actually to give us immediate sins, immediate consequences, I don't know if any of us would still be here. So for me, Matthew 5, verse 27 and 28, that says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
And that is exactly what David did. He was just, as Misati has very clearly elaborated, he was standing there and, you know, he was just looking out and he saw her. And it's important for us to realize that, you know, how our senses can be used to actually, you know, facilitate or progress our sin. So it's important for us to guard our senses with um, a lot of um, strength. So I'd, like, I'd just like to tell the story that is given in our lesson. There's a story of a six-year-old boy who was called Desmond. So this Desmond, he was very fascinated by objects. You know how small children can quickly find an interest in things. So he was very interested in things like tools, um, hammers, such things. So one day when his family had gone out, um, he realized that someone had placed a pocket knife on a table where there was nobody around. So he decided, um, since there's no one looking, the coast is clear, I can as well just go and pick it and put it in my pocket. And he did just that. He didn't know that his grandfather was looking at him from a distance. So what happens is, when he picked it and he went to a quiet place where no one was, he went and picked into his pocket and looked at it, and then he heard footsteps coming towards him. So quickly he identified a vase around him and then tried to now put the pocket knife within that vase. Now you all know how the shape of a vase is. It's as soon as you put something in, you cannot, you know, let go. Um, you cannot remove your hand if it's still in a fist. Do you get it? Like you have to, you have to release whatever is there. So when he put his hand in and his, his grandfather came and found him at that um, point in time, he was like, okay, fine. Now do I, do I, do I pretend that my hand is stuck or do I now, you know, remove it and then there will be a sound from the pen knife going deep into the vase and then I'll be caught. So he decided, you know what, I'll just stay still and wait for my grandfather to actually just come in. So his grandfather found him. And of course, you know how startled you are when someone finds you doing something wrong. So his grandfather asks him, okay, why are you afraid and why are you alone here? And he's silent. So he decides, okay, fine. He asks him, what, what is in the vase? Why is your hand there? And he says, my hand is stuck. So his grandfather goes and picks a hammer ready to come and break the vase to let his hand free. But he decides, oh my goodness, I don't want this vase to break, it's my mother's vase. So he just decides, okay, fine, I'll let it go and remove my hand. So the knife goes in and it makes a sound. And he looks in, into it, the grandfather looks and he says, okay, fine, so why were you taking this pen knife? Anyway, the point of this story is, um, sometimes we try to cover up lies, just like this little boy, Desmond, and just like the story of King David that we've seen. We try to cover up our lies instead of just facing those lies. And you know, sometimes even facing those lies will have less consequences um, than you would if you continue covering up that lie for a long time. So it's important for us even to learn from the story of David today and from this little story of Desmond that whenever you have sinned or whenever you realize that you are guilty, confess your sins at that point in time, before you start covering up, and as you say now, what do you think section, it becomes even more difficult for you to, to repent of that sin. Okay, so maybe let's get a few insights from our patriarchs and prophets from today, Misati. So our insight mm -hmm. is, the record is the prayer of David after his fall illustrates the nature of true sorrow for sin. His repentance was sincere and deep. David saw the enormity of his transgression it was, it was not for pardon only that he prayed, but for purity of heart. And yeah. the thing is, this clearly illustrates that, I mean, there, there'll be hours of temptation. There'll be opportunities that we have to sin, that is. Nonetheless, the longer we keep something in the dark, the greater power it has over us, that is. The, mom, the more we suppress things, the worse it becomes. Mm. I, the thing is, you can never overcome an emotion if you can't name the emotion. True. You clearly have to be able to... Like, for David, he had to see the full range of everything, like mm. the mess he had created. He had to see the way the murder, the, the adultery, the child born out of wedlock. He had to see all that in like a clear picture and then the picture of his oh, life God. and the picture of the kingdom. He had to see all that. Mm. And only, and only by, by being, being able, able to have it vocalized or spoken or painted was he able to see the great mess he had done. Mm. That is, because prior he was just gaslighting himself and justifying it and saying like, ah, 
something small, something just something small. But I mean, by that, by being able to name it and being able, that's how you can be able to overcome it. Amen. Thank yeah. you so much for that insight. And even as we come to a close, um, if you read the opening statement of patriarchs and prophets in this chapter 71 that you are to read, says that all the good qualities that men possess are the gift of God. Their good deeds are performed by the grace of God through Christ. And so remember how David started off very, very well. In fact, of course, we are told that David was a man after God's own heart. I mean, if we were to erase this scene, if at all this scene was not to be written in the Bible, he would have had an almost, like his record card would have been an A, straight A or A plus, if at all this, something like that. But now you see, because of this scene, he ended up, you know, having some, it was a bit mad. So my point is that, um, yes, we, we see him as a man with so many good qualities, but the Bible really doesn't talk so much about it because it doesn't want to praise him. The Bible never praises men. It, praise, it gives glory to God. So that's what um, this part of Patriarchs and Prophets was saying. Remember, David had done so many things. He had conquered a lion, he had conquered a bear, but very little is said about that, but all the glory is given. Remember, he had even conquered Goliath, actually, but glory is actually given to God. So it's important for us to realize that we are actually at risk when we are successful of feeling like we are so full of ourselves, and it is at that time that we forget God. So honestly, I, um, to me, this lesson is just a reminder that um, our God is so merciful and he is very willing and ready to forgive us our sins. As Debbie had shared earlier, that if we confess our, our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So maybe we can have um, parting shots from each one of you. Let me start with Debbie. Uh, so considering the fact that all of, us are, all of us are sinners, I don't think there's anyone who's still breathing right now who's hasn't committed a sin. <laughs> mm. uh, we should make repentance a big part of our lives, uh, considering the fact that we've been pardoned for, from so many things that we probably don't even know about. Mm. We should trust in God and repent, uh, and repent, making it part of our making it part of our da daily lives, mm. so we might get a better chance of getting into heaven. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, Silas. For me, I think that. Once you see your mistake, forget about the option of lying about it. <laughs> mm. Lying shouldn't be one of your options. Mm. You should just accept the truth and face it because it's easier at that point. Amen. Thank you so much. The thing is, I see we ought to submit ourselves to God because mm. I feel it's, it's often a difference that most Christians aren't like, yes, I want to sin, yes. But I mean, it's, it's more of like, just like you just sit down and you're like, what? I lack the moral power mm. to do this or to do that. So you're just like, God, that you do something. Because I'm like, uh, there's nothing I can do here. Because I'm just realizing that I make a mistake. I repeat the mistake. I feel bad over and over and over again, but I still do the mistake. Mm. I think it's like that moral power yeah. is something that we need to submit to God to be able to gain. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank you, our dear viewers, for tuning in and for following through with us. We pray that the lesson on the fall and rise of David has been an encouragement to you. No matter how you may have fallen, remember that you still have an opportunity to rise. It's not over yet until God proclaims the statement that he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So until then, may you still keep seeking God's face and we we'll shall meet in our next lesson. But before that, I'll invite Debbie to close for us with prayer. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our kind and heavenly Father, we thank you for guiding us throughout the lesson about David. Uh, I pray that you may help us to repent all of our sins and trust in the Lord. Help this lesson to be to to be hope for some people out there who are struggling with repentance. I pray all this trusting and believing. Amen. Amen. Amen.